Good evening, friends. Good evening. Hello to all of you, and some of you are um, have been here a while, and some of you joined tonight. So welcome if you joined tonight. Um, Want to say a special hi to Hayley Woodruff there. Um, we have uh, five interns this summer, and uh, Hayley is one of them. She's going to Jamaica. So, um, so say hi to Haley, and uh, hi, and uh, so, so glad that she's joining us tonight. And, and so I'll help her out quickly. Um, she has a fundraiser going for her trip to hey, to Jamaica to go and surf here. So if if you want to support something good, there you go. Okay. And so welcome. Let me pray for us. We'll get started. Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you so much for the opportunity to gather around the Word of God. And thank you, Father, specifically for the Gospel of John helping us to see so clearly, without a shadow of a doubt, who your Son is, who you are, Lord Jesus. And so I pray that we will just discover that again and again, over and over, yeah. as the Gospel of John yeah. is intended to help us with as we continue. I pray that your blessing will also be upon our upcoming event this Saturday. We are so excited, Lord, and just pray that you will be with us there and the missionaries <laughs> coming and that you will anoint them as they will share with us and, and Matt and Boss and Summer and Shana, perhaps even, and um, Deb Andrews that might even sing a Hebrew song. I, I just pray that your blessing will be upon the entire event. Lord, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be in this church as well, Cornerstone Christian Missionary Alliance, and have use of their facilities. Uh, may your blessing be upon Pastor Peter Rufner and this entire team here. We are so excited, um, so feel so privileged um, that uh, they make this available to us. We love you, Father, and pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So please pray for us, okay? This Saturday, May 1, we have around 70 people coming. Um, we're so glad our missionaries from Papua, their visas came through, and they even made special arrangements so that they can um, fly into Cleveland, I think, right, rent a car, drive to the event, um, then right after that, sleep over at our hotel at Columbus Airport and fly from Columbus to Papua. So we're so excited that we are coming. Our missionaries, friends from Michigan, is driving all the way over from Michigan to be with us. And Pastor Anneli will be preaching, so you don't um, even have to listen twice to me in one week. That'll be terrible. So uh, Pastor Anneli is bringing... But it's the same accent. <laughs> yeah, the same accent, so sorry about that. Um, same accent, but the Pastor Anneli has a much more peaceful way of speaking than I do. <laughs> uh, but powerful, though, so you'll enjoy that too. And um, then on Saturday evening, right after the meal... From now, let me get my timing right 5 30 to 6, around 6 20, 6 25, it will go live on Facebook. Okay, so right after the meal. So 6 20, 6 25, it will start on Facebook Live, and, and you can watch it that way too. For those of you who cannot come, understand that. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, just trying to say there's an opportunity for you. You miss that, it will go to YouTube, and you can catch it whenever you want. So, but please. We have, we have room for 10 more? Oh my goodness gracious, we have room for 10 more, there you go. Um, and um, so tell Sarah afterwards if you want to come. So everyone that joins tonight for free, okay? So there's my offer for you. No, uh, so look, those of you who, who registered early, sorry, you know, uh, what's done, what's done is done, what's done is done. Uh, but if you join tonight uh, for free, I have uh, come to realize that's a word that works very, very well in America. Um, so um, let us let us look uh, at the Gospel of John. Okay, we, we're behind a little bit uh, and we're trying to catch up, but we are. In, so somewhere in lesson two, I don't follow the notes, so um, I, I figure that all of you can read, so you can go home and read whatever I said there, and then, you know, if you just want to sit back, uh, listen and enjoy, but um, if you want to write on your notes, that's fine too, or in the little notebook, that's okay as well, of course. 
Um, we, we finished last time, I, believe, I think so, with John chapter 4. We, we talked about the harvest and how we are being called to be the reapers. Is that roughly where we finished? I think so. Yes. And then right after that, we read this incredible thing that in um, John 4, 39, that many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Um, and so they came to him and they said, please stay with us, right? And then verse 41 and because of his words, many more became believers. So what I want you to remember, you know, some of you like uh, Scott and Cheryl, they have a heart for church planting. And, um, you know, if he, I think we all, we, we would sometimes say, man, if, if just one soul could come to Christ, you know, even in a year, wouldn't that be wonderful, right? But what if, what if a village could come to Christ in a year, right? A community. So, so what we learn often from the early church is that communities come to Christ, right? So we talk about the ignition of movements in the missions world. In other words, not only individuals coming to Christ, but movements of people coming to Christ, a whole household or a couple of households, right? And then they start, they, they ignite a movement amongst their own people. And so that's what you, what you actually want, right? That's, that, that's the ideal to strive for. And you often see that um, in, you see it here in the Gospel of John, but then you often see it in Acts and also in the other letters of Paul. So hopefully one day we have time to look at that. And then we find the, you know, another miracle. Remember I told you that there are seven really, really great, very big miracles that happen in the Gospel of John. The first one was water that got turned into wine, right? That's a pretty, pretty big miracle, I would say, right? And a whole bunch of water, not just a little bit, right? So the, the miracles are almost oversized. Why? Because it's not about a miracle, it's about a semeon, it's about a sign that's pointing to something. So all the miracles in the Gospel of John points to something different. He's trying to make a point. The main question that is being addressed throughout the Gospel of John is what? Who is, who is Jesus? Okay, who is Jesus? And every miracle helps you to understand something else about who is Jesus. So here we have the royal officer's son that is sick there at Capernaum, John chapter 4, verse um, 46. And um, he is about to die, right? So he's going to die, sir, come, verse 49, before my child dies. And then Jesus says, you may go, your son will live. He goes home, verse 52, inquires about the time that his son got well. The fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour in the Jewish culture. Um, the time starts to count at sun, sunrise, okay? So that's zero, six o'clock in the morning. So seven would be one, right? So midday would be the sixth hour. So the seventh hour would be when? 1 p.m., right? So 1 p.m. So the seventh hour is 1 p.m., and so you realize at 1 p.m. at that exact time, verse 53, when Jesus said your son will live. So what happened? He and all of his household believed, right? Remember last time when we talked about the baptism, I explained to you a little bit, right? That, you know, if the, if the man comes to, to, to faith, right, then what happens? The entire household would follow. There would not be a big debate about it. People would not differ with the head of the house. You know, um, the, the wife, the children, the slaves, the concubines, the whole bunch. The entire household would come to faith, right? They do what the master says. It's as simple as that. So it was an incredibly powerful thing when men in the ancient world had come to God. And still today, it's a very powerful thing when a man leads a house spiritually as he's supposed to lead. Um, not being the master and the rest are, are his slaves, um, not being the boss and the rest are the followers, the spiritual leader, which means how do you serve men? From the bottom up, mm -hmm. from the bottom up, right? So you serve your wife and your children from the bottom up. You lift them up. You're on your knees praying for them, right? You are serving them like Jesus serves, right? Washing feet. We're going to see what that means when we get to chapter 13, hopefully next week. Um, so, um, <laughs> so that's powerful. Um, and, um, and, and, and so what do we learn about Jesus? We learn, we learn two things about Jesus. One is 
He can give life, right? Mm -hmm. The son is about to die. If Jesus did not step in, the son would die. With Lazarus, he takes it one step further because Lazarus is already a little bit dead, right? Or perhaps a lot dead, right? So he takes it a little bit further. And then he takes it a little bit further when what happens? When he dies and brings life back to himself. And then you'll go like, didn't, didn't God wake him up? Or didn't God give life to him? Ah, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the theme of life is incredibly important in the Gospel of John. And remember I told you that in the Gospel of John, often the themes get come back and come back. And often one theme is being connected with another theme. And the one theme actually helps you to understand the other theme better. How does the theme life help you to understand something better about Jesus? It helps you to understand something better about Jesus because he's the only one who can give life or prevent death. And who is that? God, right? So this is saying something about who is Jesus. Jesus is God. Who else could speak a word? And when he speaks a word, whatever he speaks, he speaks it into existence. Who else does that? God, right? From Genesis 1. Let there be light and what is there? You know? Just like Louis Giglio said, and when God said, let there be light, you did not want to stand in front of God because you would be shattered into a million pieces. Because when God said, let there be light, light came rushing out of his mouth at, I don't know, how many million miles per second, right? So you wanted to be not close to that when God said, you know, it's like being in somebody's way and you get a little bit of spat on you, but there would be like a big hole in you. It's like, you know, light went just right through you, right? So so just think about the power of that. And yeah, of, of course, Gigli was making a little bit of, you know, um, playing with that a little bit. But just the power of when God speaks, he speaks into existence. And here Jesus speaks and he speaks into existence that this child will not die, but live. And only God can do that. And so it helps you constantly to see that Jesus is God. So that's a very powerful miracle. So probably the son of Herod Antipas. Okay, so this is not a Gentile's um, son. Um, remember, Jesus does do the same kind of healings um, with the slaves of officials and those who are most probably Roman, in other words, Gentile slaves, right? Do you understand the term Gentile in the New Testament? In the early church, Gentile mean everyone that's not a Jew, right? Did not mean a Roman, did not mean a Greek, it meant anyone that's not a Jew. Jews were the only people that the Jews would see as holy, as saved, as children of God, as, you know, the, the people of God, right? All the rest, no matter their, you know, um, religion or race or whatever, the entire rest of the world are simply Gentiles. And so here it's probably Herod Antipas that served in Galilee in that period. So here we are, can say that with fair certainty at least. And then the next miracle. So three of the seven we find in chapter five. There's a man that is uh, paralyzed, right? How long has he been paralyzed? Very, very long time, right? Correct. Verse 5, 38 years. Sharon is correct. 38 years. And then something incredibly important happens about this healing. Right? He heals a man. And, um, and then the, the man is being, being cured. And then this takes place on what? It takes place on a? On a Sabbath. Right? It takes place on a Sabbath. And so this is very important. Why on earth does Jesus heal somebody on the Sabbath. That's a dangerous thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. So why not on another day? So this is important. I think you have discovered by now nothing in life happens by coincidence, right? But in the Gospel of John, I'm telling you absolutely nothing happens by coincidence. Everything that you read in the Gospel of John happens for a very, very specific reason. Again, we have a gigantic miracle here, right? The man's not just lame for a little while. You, you cannot say, well, he had a sprained ankle and that's why he can kind of get up and walk again, right? He's just kind of toughing it out, you know? <coughs> Um, no, the man definitely was paralyzed. Everybody in the community knew it. And then Jesus does something else as well. Verse 14, later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. But then Jesus connects his physical healing with spiritual healing. And that's important too. He says to, he says to him, um, 
stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. And it's one thing that you are blind, it's one thing that you are lame, it's one thing that you are deaf, it's one thing that you are paralyzed, but what is worse? You know, what is, what is worse is if you can walk or see or hear, but you don't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's worse. So he says, now that, now that you can walk, be careful, continue to follow God, or else something worse than being paralyzed is going to come to you. So rather you be paralyzed <clears throat> and lay here at the special pool in, uh, of Bethesda, um, rather than walking over to a prostitute, walking and getting yourself drink, walking and hitting someone that you have a disagreement with, walking and talking bad about somebody behind their back, walking and giving false testimony in the court. You know, so better that you rather lay there and depend on God. God, when are you coming to heal me? And at least you're wrestling with God about that than walking around and sinning. Mm -hmm. That's worse. So he says, be careful that something worse doesn't happen to you than being paralyzed. What is that? Losing life eternal. Right? So be careful. So Jesus connects his physical healing also with spiritual healing. And that's pretty important because what does that speak to? It's helping us to understand that Jesus can do something else. Jesus also is someone that wants you, can help you, can empower you to stay pure. Right? So it's also about Jesus' redemptive role here. So then a whole discussion starts about this. Why? Because Jesus did these things, chapter 5 verse 16, on what day? On the Sabbath. You cannot work on the Sabbath. Okay, that's a no-no. You're breaking a big rule, and if you do that, you get yourself into a lot of trouble. So Jesus uses this miracle. Do you see that? It's not only about the miracle. It's about what it points to. Jesus very specifically does it on a Sabbath. If Jesus didn't want to get himself into trouble and he encountered the, the paralyzed man, what would make sense? Stay another night and go tomorrow and heal the dude. I mean, why would you do it on the Sabbath? He's been paralyzed for how long? 38 years. What would be the difference, Lord, if he's paralyzed for 38 years in one day? Right? So it's almost as if Jesus is looking for trouble, respectfully say. Jesus does it specifically on the Sabbath because Jesus wants a conversation to start so that you can discover something else about him. So what does Jesus say? What is his comeback in verse 17? He says, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. And so that infuriated the Jews, and again they try harder to kill him. So it's funny in the Gospel of John. Every now and then, you kind of see the Jews walking to Jesus with you know, a whole bunch of stones, ready to kill him. And then Jesus says, Well, it's not my time yet. Sorry, guys. You know, they have to throw down these stones and go back like, okay, you know. And then Jesus upsets him again. They gather a whole lot of stones. They try to kill him. And she's like, nope, my hour has not come yet. Okay, Lord. You know. And this happens constantly in the Gospel of John. I mean, at some point you have to chuckle, you know. It's like they constantly come, going to kill Jesus. Nope, not time yet. Okay. <laughs> like, okay, let's go, you know. We have our swords this time. Let's go, let's go. Nope, not my time yet. Okay, Lord. Yeah, and it just keeps going on. And it, it, so who is Jesus? How does that help us? Jesus is the one that's truly in control. Like who? Like God. Jesus is the one that, that is completely following the exact schedule, divine schedule of his dad. Of his dad. So you see, the Jews would never call God my father. The Jews would only say to God, our father. And only when it would be in corporate worship situations. In other words, they would be together in the synagogue and as a group, they would speak to God and say, our father. To say you are my father does what to you? It puts you on the same level as God. Now for us, that doesn't make too much sense, right? Because for us as Westerners, you know, your son, whether it's your firstborn son or not, is not on the same level as you. 
You'll say you love your son, you'll say you care for your son, but what will you also say? Son, stand on your own two feet. Son, I'm a pastor, you don't have to be a pastor. I'm a farmer, you don't have to be a farmer. You know, see what you enjoy in life, do what you are good with. You know, you need to make your own way, you need to stand on your own two feet and fight for yourself. If you don't fight for yourself, nobody else will, blah, 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 all these things that we say, right? Um, and so, for in the ancient world, that did not happen. A father and a firstborn son are completely the same. Your whole goal as a firstborn son is to become your father. A firstborn son, and so something else is being introduced here, a firstborn son would want to duplicate the father completely. When they start to debate about something, if you listen to the son and you listen to the father in two different places debating the exact same thing, the firstborn son will debate that um, whatever you're busy debating, you know, should we uh, stone this woman that committed adultery? The, the firstborn son is debating it here and the father is debating it here separately and they will debate it the exact same way. They will act the same way, they will debate the same way, they do the same thing. Your father, is a far, your father is a farmer, you want to be a farmer. Your, your, your father is, you know, um, works with wood, then what do you want to do? You, you want to work with wood, you don't, don't, don't want to go and do something else. You want to duplicate your father, that's what an honorable son does. An honorable son is completely obedient because why? You need to represent the lineage of, thy fa of, thy, of the, your father. The father dies when you step in and and you know and your father's name gets carried on right so that's what it, so when jesus says my father in the ancient culture that was like whoa what are you saying what are you saying are you saying you are truly his son uh, you are actually on the same level as god you know it's one thing to say we are here and our father Right? So he's there, he's at a distance. We all are honoring him as our father, like you would say, our king. Right? So it's, it's like that. But my father, that's like, I'm going home with him. You know, I'm in the same house as him. I sit at the same table as him. There's a personal relationship here going on. So, so, so this is a mind-blowing thing. So Jesus says, why can I work on a Sabbath? I'm just doing what my father is doing. My father is working on the Sabbath. Why should I not be working on, on the Sabbath? What is his father doing on the Sabbath? His father is providing, right? And everybody understood that. God stops working on the Sabbath and you'll stop breathing. God stops working on the Sabbath, you will not wake up to have a Sabbath, right? So God stops and everything stops. God, God has to continue to work, otherwise it all comes apart. And so Jesus is saying, I have to work because my role is a role of redemption. As my father keeps going so that you can breathe, my role is to keep, keep going so that you can come to salvation because you might die today and tomorrow you're lost. So I have to work on the Sabbath so that you can have life. My Father makes certain that you have, can breathe and eat, and I make certain that you can have spiritual food and go to heaven. So they tried to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, the end of verse 80, but he was even calling his own Father, making himself what? Equal with God. So they pick this up. They don't drop this. They pick it up in chapter 7. So we're going to finish chapter 7 hopefully also tonight. So let's jump into chapter 7 and you'll see it there. Um, they talk about the same miracle, and then Jesus um, continues this debate with them because they won't drop it. And so in John chapter 7, verse 22, Jesus says, Moses gave you circumcision. But it actually did not come from Moses, it came from the patriarchs, and that's important. The circumcision came from the patriarchs, not from Moses, but the people would say, Moses gave the law that we need to, you know, not work on the Sabbath, right? But did the circumcision come before the law or after the law? Before. Before, 
right? Circumcision came through Abram in Genesis 17. When did the law come? Through Moses in Exodus 20, right? So long before the law was given, circumcision was there. And so what did they do now? God says you need to circumcise and you need to do that with little boys from what age? Uh, from the eighth day. You know, on their eighth day, you need to do that. So what did people do? On the eighth day, as the patriarchs, as Abram, in other words, said, they would circumcise a boy. That right was being called a right of perfection, right? So something that was not perfect was made perfect. This man cannot be perfect and remember... You ask, well, why didn't they, uh, we have not said this, but it's kind of assumed. Remember, you're in a men's world. Whatever happens to your husband happens by implication to you. Remember that, right? Mm -hmm. So why do you only need to circumcise the man? Because it happens by implication with everything else, right? If, if I decide to, 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 um, to buy this chair, you know, then whatever, whatever I want to do happens to the chair, right? So I go home, the chair goes with me, right? The chair cannot decide to stay in the furniture store because it's nice and cozy there, and now he needs to go home and every, someone's going to sit on it every day. But the chair cannot decide. The chair gets into my car and go with me, whether I have a fancy house or, a, you know, not so fancy house. But the chair needs to go to where I go. The chair has no choice. So um, women and children was truly seen as... The possessions of the man. That's why if a man has a wife and the wife cannot produce a child, what does a man do? His wife will even say, take a concubine or go and sleep with one of the slave girls. It was, it was not a bad thing. It's not that like the husband is prostituting his wife or whatever. The, the wife understands my function as this position of this man is I need to be a chair that the man can sit on. Well, my chair has a broken leg. My, 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 you know, the man comes and sits and the chair, you know, falls down. So what, need, what do you need to do? To pull up a different chair, right? Don't necessarily throw the chair out, but you pull up a different chair to fulfill that function. I'm not trying to make any woman feel bad. I'm trying to help you to understand, you know, the culture of what you find here because it will really help you. Was the woman, in other words, included in the covenant that God had started with Abram? Yes. So you can choose to feel, as a woman, you can choose to feel bad and throw a fit and whatever, or you can choose to see the way that it was intended, and that was, you were included, right from the very start. So in other words, were you circumcised? Yes, you were. Were you perfect before you were circumcised? No. <laughs> because the moment that you accepted the sign of circumcision, it meant that you are now one of the people of God. You carry now the sign that you now belong to God and that's the most perfect condition that you can be in. Before this sign on your body, you do not belong to God. Right? Now you carry the sign, it perfects you. It perfects your imperfection as not belonging to God to now you belong to God. It shifts you from here, not belonging to God, to here, belonging to God. It's a very powerful thing. When you need to do that? On the eighth day. Did anybody ever thought about, I should not do it on the, uh, today on the Sabbath? No. Why? The law did not come yet. The law that you should not work on the Sabbath was not there yet. So now the law comes. So what do the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees do? Do they quit circumcising on the Sabbath? No. Why? Because the patriarchs already started this. And they didn't all fall dead. So obviously God was okay with that. So what did they do? They continue that. And how can it be bad to help somebody? Listen carefully because, you know, here's a big cherry on the cake if you so don't miss it okay so so why is this so important somebody that's not perfect what could be more perfect than becoming perfect on a special day that God had set apart from the other days Amen. Yeah. right yeah. what could be more special than becoming perfect on God's perfect day Amen. Yeah. everybody understood that 
So what does Jesus do? He says, you have a problem, but I healed this man on the Sabbath and told him, no sin no more. Let not something in your body only change, but let something spiritually change too. Remember that? Man, nobody put it together like God, right? So what does he say? I think you got it now. He says in chapter 7 verse 23, Now, if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Stop seeing, and we found that too all the time. Stop seeing things around you only on a physical level. Start to see things through a spiritual level. If you see things only through a physical level, you will judge it as being wrong, or judge what is wrong as being right. You need to look at things around you through a spiritual lens so that you can realize when it is actually correct. And you should not judge it. In this case, you should not judge it. Because from a spiritual level, what did Jesus do here? And remember, the people in the ancient world thought very, very literal about things. What did they do with a man that got circumcised? They were only busy, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, to, to use offensive language here, but I just want you to get what Jesus is trying to say here, okay? What were they busy with? with, with how much of the man were they busy with? They were busy with a minute part of the man's body, right? They cut up a little piece of flesh about yay big, okay? So they, they were busy with a small part of his body and said, this is so important that we need to do this even on the Sabbath. With what part of the body was Jesus busy with? With the whole man. With the whole man. So Jesus said, I don't get upset with you guys. <laughs> Making someone perfect on God's perfect day, being busy with only a small part of his body. I am working on his whole body, making the man entirely new. How on earth can you be upset with me? So, Jesus is in other words, listen carefully, they try to prove Jesus is a Sabbath breaker. Jesus goes into debate with them. And proves that he's actually a Sabbath fulfiller. But he's actually fulfilling the Old Testament laws. And doing far more than what it could accomplish by itself. So what is happening here is so powerful on so many levels. And you can go and you can read when, when you're back home. You can read Matthew 12, 8. You can read Mark 2, 27 and 28. And you will see that Jesus says, I am... Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus proves it here. He says something like this. This is powerful. If you ever wonder, well, can I do this on the Sunday or can I not do this on the Sunday, right? How do I need to think about it? This is what Jesus says. He says, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Because what did the Jews, how did they treat the Sabbath? And you see that every time you go to Israel, even today, right? How do they treat the Sabbath? The Sabbath arrives, and what happens? Man is made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath arrives, and suddenly there's a slew of rules. Today you can only walk so far. Today you can only eat food that you cooked yesterday. T today you, you, you cannot do all of these kind of works. You can only do absolutely necessary works like your cow gets stuck in a you know, dry pit or whatever, and you can help your cow, right? Or you can circumcise someone, or so only very specific things, right? So the Sabbath arise, arrives, and suddenly arises a whole bunch of rules that you need to follow. Man is made for the Sabbath. What does Jesus say? He says that was never God's intention. God's intention was the Sabbath is made for man. So, so, to do what? Right. To honor God, right? That was the whole idea, always. So here are you, and here is the Sabbath. So during the week, you, you run, you know, and you try and keep up, and, and, and you might lose a little bit of perspective, and your priorities might get skewed, and whatever. Sunday arrives, 
And how does that day help you? The Sunday serves you by, by helping you to regain perspective. So Sabbath is made for the man, not man for the Sabbath. Right? So, so the Sabbath serves you. Sabbath made for the man. The Sabbath serves you by giving you rest. By, by taking your eye off of the worldly stuff. By letting you sing not only, you know, the songs that you sing when you, when you, um, you know, um, at a sport event. I don't know what songs you sing at sport. I don't go there. But, but you're at a baseball <laughs> thing and you chant some stupid thing. I don't know what you do there. But, you know, you encourage your team or whatever, right? And, you, you know, it's like you're not only singing those things. You are also singing worship songs, right? So the Sabbath serves you by helping you to regain perspective, reset your priorities, you know, energize you from the inside out. You see God clearer. You realize that you've messed up like 50 times in this week. And, and how can you do that differently in the week to come, right? Mm -hmm. Sabbath is made for the man. And that's what Jesus says. Mm -hmm. So clearly we see now, Jesus is truly like his father, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if he is Lord over the Sabbath, then he must truly be, be God, right? You just used Sabbath and Sunday interchangeable, yeah. but it, there is a difference. Uh, yeah, what, what's the difference? Sabbath is on a Saturday, strictly speaking, but we chose to make our Sabbath on a Sunday. Yeah. Just... Yeah, why? Well, we, we celebrate Jesus' resurrection yeah. every Sunday, but also it became very difficult for the early Christians to be in the same yeah. church as the Jews on the Sabbath, yeah. and that's why they... Exactly. I'm so proud of my wife. She listens to me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so why do I use Sabbath and Sunday interchangeably? Because the early Christians did the exact same thing. Okay? The Jews would come to Christ. Where would they go to church? What do you think? They would go to church in the synagogue. Mm -hmm. On the Sabbath. What do you think they would do? My, my brother? My dad? Just came to Christ. Right? To, to, to what church are we going to? We serve the same God, right? We're just understanding something incredibly important about our God. And that's that. The Messiah that we heard about in this synagogue for all of our lives. Have been praying for about for all of our lives. He came. Where on earth do you think I'm going to celebrate that? In the synagogue. Yeah. When? On the Sabbath. My goodness gracious. Are you going to tell your dad? Nope, I'm going to go tomorrow. See you, dad. Like in the ancient culture, how do you think that's going to go down? Really, 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 really bad. Okay? And so, so time goes by. And the Jews, the Judaistic Jews, gets more and more frustrated with this thing. But some people continue to say that Jesus did rise from the dead and that he is God and that he is the Savior and he is the Messiah. And they get more and more upset about that. And what do they do? They add to their confession of faith another line at the end, right? The Shema, the thing that the Jews would, would, would re, um, recite every Sabbath, uh, right? We, we believe da 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 da. And they add to that at the bottom and everyone that says that Jesus is God is a heretic. So now I go to the Sabbath. I'm so excited. I say my confession of faith, but I've learned since yay high from memory. And I get there and I'm like, uh, I cannot say that. You have to say that or else leave. But, but I don't want to leave. But you have to say this. I cannot say that. And so we got stuck. And so we realized we need to distinguish ourselves. How will we distinguish ourselves? Well, I... We need to gather in a different location. And when will we gather? When will we do this? Let's do this on the day that what? That Jesus rose from the dead. Let's do this on, on the Sunday. Okay? And so the church started to gather. The Christian church started to gather on the Sunday. Do you think it was an easy thing? For the Jews specifically, for the, for the heathen people, the Gentiles, the Greeks, the Romans, no big deal, right? Like, when do we go? On Sundays. Okay, let's go. 
Can you imagine what happened in the Jewish homes? It was a battle. So is there a difference between Sabbath and Sunday? Not in the intention of the day. Not in what's supposed to happen on that day. Are you, are you going to, to a better portion of heaven or a little bit quicker um, if you, if you, you know, make the Sabbath your, your, the, the Saturday or Friday, whatever day you want to pick. There's a big debate about that too, by the way. But whatever day you want to pick, you know, will you go to heaven on a, on a better day, a different day? For example, we have friends in Dubai. We, we, when do they celebrate Sunday? When do they go to church? Friday. On a Friday. Why do we do it on a Friday? But in the Muslim world, on Sunday they need to show up at work. So they lose their jobs if they don't go to work on a Sunday. So what do the Christian churches do in Dubai? They go to church on a Friday. My goodness gracious, I hope you did not got, get so stuck on a name of a week that you're missing the God who makes every day. And who says the whole idea of the day is that the day serves you and not the day you. I hope you got it by now. It's not about, you know, you want to, but you better not go with, well, I have discovered that the Sabbath is actually better. You know, what I'm going to do this on the Sabbath, and you poor folks, you still don't get it, don't you? You know, you're all lost, because you're still doing it on a Sunday, and I'm doing it on the Sabbath. Do you realize what you're doing? You're doing exactly what the Pharisees did. You're doing exactly that thing. Oh, Lord. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. You realize that? Jesus says, are you missing it? It's about what God wants. And it's about how we honor Him. It's not about this day or that day. It's about what do you do? And it's not about, what, you know, is, is it better to serve God on this day or is it better to serve God on that day? You just need to do what you are supposed to do on the day that, you know, that works where that day can serve you to reset your perspective and to reset your priorities, and to glorify God again, and, and to do what you need to do. So, so you know, so you, we need to be so incredibly careful with what we do with this thing. And so that's why I have absolutely no problem using Sabbath, or Friday in the Arab world, or Sunday interchangeably. Because it's not about that specific <coughs> day. It's about what you do on that day. You can mess up, doing on the Sunday that you are supposed to do horribly on the Sunday. <laughs> Would you agree with that? So you better be careful what you say and what you do, right? So um, are you doing what is that day doing for you what it's supposed to do on the day that you are chosen for you to do what you're supposed to do, right? So, well, I think I almost confused myself. So the early Christian Jews went on a Sunday, but a Sunday would be a work day for the other people in Israel. Right. I mean, they got to work on it. So they go to their boss and boss, you're supposed to be at work today, but you can't. So they got a problem there too. Yeah, absolutely. It was very difficult. It was very difficult. So some of them probably lost their jobs. Some of them had to start to work together. Some of them would sell their lands and say, you know, let's help you out. Let's do this together here. So there was all kinds of political, socio-economical shifts, all kinds. It was not easy for the Jews, specifically for the Jews that came to Christ. It was not easy. It was very, very difficult. They also get together like in the evenings. Yeah, sure. Sometimes they got together on, on the evenings too. When they too. talk about the Holy yeah. Communion, they, yeah. the people working yeah, on the fields absolutely. came late and the others were there yeah, early. Yeah, absolutely. They did that too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Acts 2 says every evening they got together, right? Every day. Oh, not every every day they got together, right? They broke bread, they worshipped together. Every, every day they did that. So, yeah, so no did, TV. They could. Why did Christians <laughs> meet on Friday? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, gotcha. the so Muslims shut everything down. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's a, it's an it's a opportunity to testify, oh, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all the Christians going, like, you know, perhaps they... I don't know, perhaps something that they do makes sense, you know, perhaps we should acknowledge that, right? So, yeah. No, I see they, yeah. they that's why they do it, because they yeah. stay off. The Muslims, I don't know what the Muslims do on the Sabbath, but 
Yeah. Yeah. They, go to the they go to the mosque. Yeah. Yeah. They go to the mosque. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, okay. You, you, you have South Africa, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we were in Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you, have, uh, you have any more questions on this? So you get it, guys. It's truly not about the name of the day. You know, It's about what, what, what's the intention of that day. It's, it's so far, far more important. Okay, so um, Jesus continues in chapter 5, verse 19. And I already kind of explained that to you. Um, it's important. Very important what Jesus... Sorry. Chapter 5? Uh, back in chapter 5, yes. Yep. That back into chapter 5, verse 19. We jump to chapter 7 because I need to explain about the circumcision. So in chapter 5, verse 19, um, there, there's something else that's really important there too. Um, Jesus, uh, the Son, uh, verse 19, the Son can do nothing by Himself. That is typically what the firstborn Son in the ancient world would say. You know, I only do what I do because of my dad, right? They would constantly give honor to the dad. Um, he, can, he can do, the son can do, middle of verse 19, only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. The father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. So, again... In the ancient world, we struggle to see it in our world, but in the ancient world, what would people say? Jesus is saying what? He's saying, I am God. He's saying, I am on the same level of, as God, because when you look at me, you will see I can you know, um, have paralyzed people walk again. I can turn water into wine. Um, I can speak, and in that moment, somebody is healed, even if I'm not with them. Um, and also, listen carefully, verse 21, um, because the theme of life comes in again. Verse 21, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives him life, listen carefully, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Now some of the prophets like Elijah and so on, they were special, right? They would also pray and, and children and so on would come back to life, right? Do you remember that? So some of the prophets could also pray and people would come back to life. But what would happen? It would be people that they would plead with God to bring back to life. Very specific people that God would allow them to speak to and they would come to life. What is different here? Jesus is saying what? He gives life to whom he? To whom he wants to. To whom he pleases to. Right? Who does that? God. Okay? So it's really important that in this theme of life that, that, that starts here and gets ramped up more and more and more. First it was the son, right? He speaks and the son doesn't die, right? Now he comes and he says, just like God can give life, I can too give life. Just like God can choose who to give life to, I too can choose who do I give life to. Mm -hmm. You see, the Jews say three things that makes you God. Right? That only belongs to God. One is only God can open the storehouses of heaven so that it rains. Remember, ancient people, not necessarily what I believe today, right? I'm with you. I think the earth is round and all these things. Ancient world, earth is flat. There's a dome. The color is blue. Everybody knows that. Just go out and during the day and you'll see. You know, and, and then there are storehouses above the dome. Some is full of snow, some is full of hail, some is full of what? With rain. And when God wants to, He opens it up and it rains. If God doesn't want to, He can close it up and for three years, like in the Old Testament, what will happen? It will not rain. If He wants to, He can open it up and kind of forget that it's open. And what happens then? It floods. Okay, so who is in charge of that? God, only God. It can be only God because it's above the dome where no man can go. So only God can be there. So he can make it rain, right? You can go and look at Deuteronomy 28.12. It's in your notes too, Deuteronomy 28.12. And then there is something else that God does. Um, we read that with Rebecca, he says that he opened her womb, right? So Genesis 30.22 or something. So only God can open the womb, right? So that's why, you know, Sarah can be really, really old. And what, what happens? God opens her womb. 
So for Mary to be pregnant, not a big deal. Why? God can open the womb. Right? So God can do that. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter whether you're a virgin or whether you are really, really old. If God wants to open the womb, God can open the womb because God has a key that opens the womb of a woman. Okay? So, so this is really important. So who and whatsoever thing, he can, he can give life, right? To whom he pleases to. And so that theme is being introduced here. And so look very carefully at, um, uh, at verse uh, 26, for example. So, well, let's look at verse 25 too, because it's an interesting one. I tell you the truth, a time is coming, it has come now, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Now, right? <clears throat> time has come now. Where the dead will hear my voice and come to life. So if Jesus would walk in Israel through the, you know, the graveyard and they would hear him speak to his disciples, all, all, the, all the dead people ran out of the graves. Did you read that? No. Did you, you miss that one? Well, you need to go and read again because that's a pretty neat verse. Of course it's not there, right? <laughs> David goes, goes like, I've read the gospel like a million times. It's not there. It is definitely not there. <laughs> Some of you were like, man. Where is that? I'm going to read that. <laughs> remember, remember, right, so many times in the Gospel of John, this dualism, right? Jesus speaks on things at a spiritual level. People keep misunderstanding him because they hear it on a physical level. Jesus is speaking on a spiritual level, right? He's talking about even now when I speak to people who are spiritually dead, if they hear my voice and truly hear my voice, what will happen to them? They will come alive, right? They will come alive and they will actually truly live for the first time. And then he says, verse 26, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. So suddenly he's speaking about... Now, even when you are in the grave, I can even get you out there. I can give you spiritual life. I can even give you physical life. I, who have life, um, the Father has life in himself. He has granted the Son to have life in himself. If Jesus has life in himself, it means that he is, that he is God. It also means, if you have life in yourself, it also means that you can give life back to yourself. So Jesus is starting to prepare them to see that when he goes into the grave, he can do what? He can give life back to himself, which is the ultimate proof of what? Who Jesus is. He is God. So you see, when, when in the Gospel of John, when Jesus dies, Jesus dies for our sin, and God cannot be a part of that, Right? So, my father, my father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? And so God leaves Jesus, and Jesus goes into the grave alone on a theological level, okay, in the Gospel of John. He goes in there alone, so he cannot get out of there unless one of two things happened, right? God needs to give life to him. But God does not want nothing to do with your sin that is now on Jesus. Somebody needs to die for that. Mm -hmm. So Jesus dies alone, which is a mind-blowing thing that I still cannot understand. I want to at least spend the first century in heaven to talk that through with Jesus. <laughs> right? So, so God leaves God. So try and wrap your mind around that for you. Okay, so God is in the grave alone because he's carrying the punishment for your sin, which is death. And then because he has life in himself, he gives life back to himself and comes out. So what happens now is resurrection becomes proof of who he is, becomes the proof of of who he is mm -hmm. and therefore you need to try and get rid of that proof so therefore you need to come up with a lie 
somebody stole his bones or whatever. You need to cover that up because it proves beyond any doubt that Jesus is what? That Jesus is God. And therefore, even to this very day, there's an enormous attack on the resurrection of Jesus. Because if you can, if you can have a little cloud of doubt over the empty grave, Everything falls apart. What does Jesus say? If, 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 if Je uh, Paul say, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, it's all for nothing. Let us go and have a party, right? And just get stuck into this world as much as we can, as long as we can, because it all means nothing. If that is not true, it all means nothing, because it means Jesus is not God. So it means he cannot really free you from your sin. It means he cannot really walk with you. It means he cannot really help you to live a holy life. It's, it, it all comes apart. If that comes apart, it all comes apart. So let me introduce this to you as well, and you'll see more and more as we continue. In the Gospel of John, you literally cannot pull the crucifixion and the resurrection apart from each other. It's actually the same thing. When Jesus says, my time has come, what is he speaking about? My time has come for me to be crucified and raised from the dead because it doesn't help that it's only crucified and it doesn't help that he only gets raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. he, it has to be both. Yep. If he dies for your sin and stays dead, it means nothing. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't die for your sin, he just dies because he wants to die, lives, grow old, die a normal life, wants to have nothing to do with you. It also doesn't help. It has to be crucified for your sin, and then it has to be raised from the dead. And those two things need to work both. Otherwise, you and I are in big trouble, eternal yeah. trouble. Yeah. So by myself, verse 30, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. My judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but he who sent me is exactly what a son in the ancient world would say. Jesus is the perfect son. The perfect son would be a perfect replacement for a dad. You could take the dad out of the picture and look at the son and you would still see the dad. And therefore Jesus says, if you see me, you see the father. You see the father. Mm -hmm. Do you realize how important John 5 is? Mm -hmm. It's incredibly important. John chapter 6, you know that very well, right? Um, the miracle, another miracle. It's a big miracle. Verse 4, it happens on Jewish Passover. Um, there's an enormous crowd. Not enough bread. Jesus says something that you do not find in the other Gospels. You only find it here. So it has to be important. He says this. He says... He asked this, verse 6, John 6, 6, he asked this only to test them, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. He wants to see what his disciples do, right? So it's a big task, wants to see what the disciples will do. He already knows what he will do. What do, they, what do the disciples do? They do exactly what you and I do. Trouble hits you, and what's the first thing that we do? Uh, yeah, well, that's what we should do, right? <laughs> We look at our checkbook, right? We look at how much money do we have to fix this problem, right? So, and that's what the disciples do. Philip answered in verse 7, Eight months of wages would not buy enough bread for each one of them to even have a bite. So we don't have enough money. Um, and then uh, Andrew does the second thing that we often do. We look at our resources. Who do we know? What, do we, what else do we have available, right? You look at your connections. You look at your resources. Finds a little boy... So we, we, we found someone, he, what does he have? He has five loaves of bread and, you know, two pieces of fish. That's not enough, right? So our money, our resources, our connections, none of it is working. Lord, this will not work. And Jesus does what? He says, sit, let them sit down and he prays, right? And he feeds all of them. What was the correct answer to the question? <clears throat> Jesus says, feed them. He asked ask this of them only to test them. What was the correct answer? What David shouted, right? You, you run to God. You, you run to God. You go to God. You remember that what? You remember you're not alone. I'm not saying you don't look at your money, you don't look at the resource, you don't call a friend. I'm saying where do you start? You start with God, right? You start with God. So it would have been so cool if the disciples would have said, Lord, we have no clue, but we have you. We have no idea, but we have you. So, you know, you already turned water into wine and said a word and somebody got healed. And, you know, you, you, you healed a man that was paralyzed for 38 years. We have you. 
So this will be a cool day because, uh, you know, something great is going to happen again. Make it happen, Lord. Um, let's praise the Father. And let's, you know, so wouldn't that be so amazing? So it was not about the five loaves and the fish and whatever. It's like Jesus is saying, I am here. Okay. It is the Jewish Passover. We have learned from the first miracle, certain miracles in the Gospel of John happens on very specific days for a very specific reason. It just doesn't happen, you know, just on Sunday for some reason. I don't think it's any coincidence that the little boy had what with him? Bread. I don't think it's any coincidence that the boy had bread there. They feed everybody. How much bread from Sunday school days? You don't even have to look at the text. How much bread is left? Twelve baskets. Why nothing? Why no fish? Have you ever wondered about that? Why did you read about fish that was left? <laughs> it was bread and fish. Huh? It was bread mixed with fish. Yeah, sure. You know, so you only read that they were bread left. What, have you ever wondered why 12 baskets? Why not 9? Well, why not 13? Why not 300? You know? Why was there anything left at all? Right? So there's 12 left. And it's 12 baskets of bread that's left. Man, it, the, in, in, the, in the Jewish world, a million bells would go off immediately. They would gather that bread and they would be, let's count them, 12. <gasps> 12! Right? They are divided in how many tribes? 12. Yeah. Yes, you are correct, Patty. How many disciples stand there? 12. Twelve. Here is the Messiah, and he chooses how many disciples? Twelve. To represent who? To represent the new Israel. The twelve tribes represent who? Israel. The twelve disciples that represent who? They need to go to whom? They need to go to the ends of the earth. Who would that be? To the new Israel, right? We covered that when we did the book of Revelation. So, um, Patty gets a, you know, a lollipop, right? She got it right tonight. <laughs> so, so, 12. And then it happens on the Passover. <coughs> I'm sorry. What happened on the Passover? Right? The, the, the Jews are stuck in Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. Trouble is coming. What can save them? Passover can save them, right? They need to get, get the, the blood on the doorpost and they need to eat certain bread and so on and the angel of death would pass them by and they are being saved by God, by Passover, they are being saved. And so God says, continue to celebrate that. Here at Passover, Jesus feeds the people. They do not die, therefore, of hunger. They are being sustained physically and then sustained physically, but it's a miracle that points to something, right? It's a semeon. It is a sign. So they are being fed physically, but 12 baskets are being left over. You agree with me? They had their full. The function of the miracle is complete. Why 12 baskets? Nobody can eat it because, you know, they've had enough. So who's going to eat it? Is it like a doggy bag going home? Jesus is being kind, right? Yeah. Really? It's like, no, you know, just turning water into wine so that you have permission to drink. It would be the same stupid thing. Do you agree with me? You know, so for heaven's sake, it has to be something more than that. So they see that and they realize it's Passover time and they look at their Messiah and they go like, he can feed all of us spiritually too forever. That's who he is. He is the Passover lamb. And he can now prevent the angel of death to pass you by. And therefore, even when you die, you don't have to, um, you know, get into some fearful state because the angel of death will pass you by. Death becomes just another step out of this world from the below into his world of the above. And that's all it is.
And if you stole one, then, well, you know, I'm not so sure. I think Pastor Wayne's making a little bit too much of this, you know. Um, Jesus continues in the same chapter, in chapter 6, and he, he works with Moses, who prayed the bread from heaven, verse 32, and Jesus says, My Father, who gives, is the one who gives you the true bread from heaven, verse 33, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they say, give us of this bread, and what does Jesus declare? I am that bread. I am that bread. You eat of this bread, you'll continue to be hungry. You eat of my bread, you will never go hungry. You come to me, then I will never drive anyone away who, who, who comes to me. The Father says, come to me. Come and eat of that manna. The Father is for one sending the manna from heaven. You understand what's happening here, right? Mm -hmm. So people say, Moses brought us manna in the desert. Jesus says, no, 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 no. You have to remember... The Father gave the manna. Mm -hmm. Nobody would disagree with that. Right. So he says, just like the Father sent the manna, I am now the manna. I am now the bread of life. He says, and whoever the Father sends to me, if I'm the manna, and you go like, I'm going to pick that up and eat that, and eat that, verse 37, Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Verse 40, for the Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him, shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And he can do that because there's life in him, right? And we wonder what is belief about. So do you see the connection of the themes? Belief means that you have life. If you wonder what does belief mean, how exactly does that work, then you need to remember that belief is connected with bread of life. It's not my ideas. It's literally in the text. Let me take you to verse 47. I tell you the truth. He who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. There's some connection here between belief and bread of life. What is that connection? If you still wonder, let's jump to verse 53. I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of man, and drink his blood. We've already been there. The first miracle. We already covered that. He said, if you would drink my wine, my blood, if you would eat my flesh, my bread, if you would eat it and drink it, you, um, uh, unless you do that, you will have no life. However, you eat it, you drink it, you will have eternal life. I will raise you up. To the last day, for my flesh is the real food, my blood is the real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Remains in me, and I in him. What does belief mean? Belief connects you with life. If you ask, well, what does it mean when I say I believe in Jesus? It does not mean the following. It does not mean that you learn about him. It does not mean that you ponder about him. It does not mean that you tell others about him. It, it does not mean that you do certain things to honor Him. It does not mean that you give your money to Him. It does not mean that you have every Sunday hold it in a most perfect, wondrous way. It does not mean that you can sing like Him and uh, sing the most beautiful songs to Jesus. It, it does not mean um, any of those things. Mm -hmm. What does belief mean? It means that you eat Him. And what goes in here... None of you have realized that, but it never goes out in the same way. <laughs> what goes in here, something happens to you. It sustains you. It fuels you. It drives you. It, it lifts you up. You feel like you have power again. You have strength again. What does it do? What does this bread do? It comes out in different ways. Right? Some of it goes out in a little bit of a gross way. We're not going to take the metaphor there. But a lot of it comes out in positive ways, right? It makes you what? Sings in a beautiful way. It makes you what? 
It gives you the strength to work and give money to God. It does what? It gives you the ability to go and serve in a soup kitchen. It does what? It gives you, it fuels your brain so that you can think and realize your priorities are wrong on a Sunday. I need to shift that. Okay, it, it helps you to remember God is God and therefore it gives you the strength to stay awake on your knees and not fall asleep on your knees and pray throughout the night. You understand? So doing all these things and think that you believe is not belief. Belief is you need to eat him. You need to drink him. He need to change you from the inside out. And so Jesus says, if you don't eat me, if you don't drink me, then all of these things that you do, Jewish leaders, because if you think, if you think you're doing it right and saying it right, you are not even close, not even close to a conservative Jew. I promise you that. You will pale in comparison to a Judaistic Jew. Pale in comparison. You cannot get there. These Pharisees and Sadducees, but you go like, man, these poor guys were very stupid. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you're trying to do it like what they did, you will fail miserably, horribly. I promise you, you fail by far by a landslide. The only way to get it right. Is you need to eat him. You need to drink him. He needs to come in. And then from the inside out. You worship him. And you give your money. And you give your time. And you adore him. And you tell others about him. And you change the world from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Or else it means absolutely nothing. Only then can you say. Like he says. Only then can you say. He remains in me and I in him, end of verse 56. So there's a very weird thing that I skipped, right? Like what on earth does the storm on the Sea of Galilee have anything to do with this? John must have fallen asleep, you know, rode that in here, woke, you know, woke up and realized, oh, I forgot to finish my story on the break. Let me continue with that. Why is that story in the middle of this whole thing about the break? Right? So verse 16 of John 6, he walks on the water. Um, you know, the disciples go down the lake. Um, and, and then um, by now it was dark. Jesus had not yet joined them. Can I ask you, do you think it's by coincidence that this happens while it's dark? I don't think so. Do you think Jesus can walk on the water during daytime too? <laughs> I think he might be able to do that. Right? So why in the dark? And why does he come immediately connected with Jesus had not joined them yet? They are alone. They are in the dark. What is Jesus? What is the Gospel of John also saying to us on a different level? As long as you stay connected with Jesus... <laughs> The fear goes away and strength comes. As long as you stay close to Jesus, peace is there and you can do incredible things. Jesus is far, the dark will come. Evil will get you. Distance between you and Jesus and uneasiness in your heart will come. Fear will creep in. It will feel to you as if there's an enormous storm raging around you. And there is. The wind is blowing. The waters grew rough. And then what happens with Jesus? He's walking on the water. But in the Gospel of John, he doesn't encourage his Peter to come and join him. Okay? I'm not saying it did not happen. In the Gospel of John, that's being left out. Because what does Jesus want? To, what does John want to see us in the Gospel of John? He only wants us to constantly see Jesus. Who is Jesus? He is the one that the moment that Jesus um, that, that they see Jesus again. He says to them, what? It is, it is I. Ergo I me. It is I. When, when, the, when, the, uh, um, when, when Moses asked, whom, whom shall I say? Send me. How does God answer? I am. I am. Send you. God, right? So they are afraid. They are scared. 
Distance between them and Jesus happened. Jesus arrives, introduces himself. How does he introduce himself? With the same words that God introduced himself in the Old Testament. He says, I am God. I am easier. And the moment there's no more distance between them and Jesus, God is on the scene. The moment that happens, he says, don't be afraid. They take him into the boat, and it's very, very weird. They are three and a half miles from shore, okay? Look at verse 19. They have rowed three, three or three and a half miles. You see that? They take quite a bit away. But look what John does with the words in the Gospel of John. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. You know, there's a bunch of questions that I have. Do you have a list of questions you want to sort out one day when you get to heaven? That's one of my lists too. I would go like, John, tell me, what happened that night, right? When Jesus got in that boat, you know, did, did something happen where... Yes, they were on the other know? side. Yeah, but... The, Three and a half miles, let's do the other side. <laughs> either that, either that, or, you know, that last ride was just so peaceful that they were just there. You know, so, so, so you can choose to believe like summary, you know, the boring, the boring way, the, 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 totally, the totally boring way, or, or, or we can go with the more exciting way, you know. They are deep into this, and um, they are not yet at the shore. Jesus walks onto the shore, and with, with not rowing to the shore anymore, the next moment they're just there. I, I choose to believe that. You believe what? You, the boring, boring one? And they just boring. Yeah. So, um, but, but the, I, I agree, I agree. What, what I want you to hear is so incredibly powerful, right? That in the middle of this passage where Jesus says, you cannot just rub shoulders with me. You cannot just see, sit and see and watch the incredible things. You cannot just get it. You sit and you study and go like, I get it now. All of those things are part of it. But he cannot stay at a distance. He stays at the distance. You will walk out of here. You'll go right back and doing the exact same sin yeah. that you've always been doing. Mm -hmm. You know? You, 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 don't, you don't eat him. You don't drink him. You'll go out of here. And you will continue to do the things that you are lacking in doing. That you're supposed to do and not do. Doing good things, not great things. Doing good things, but not the right things. Nothing will change. When does it change? When we eat him, when we drink him, no distance. And he changes from the inside out. Okay. Isn't this a powerful chapter, friends? And then we find a slew of this in chapter 7, okay? So, verse 6. The right time for me has not yet come. For you guys, any time is right. Right, so this happens all the time now. This eight, you go to a feast, these uh, um, uh, um, disciples and so on wants him to go quickly to the, to, the, to the Jewish feast of the tabernacles. And Jesus says, you go to the feast, chapter 7, verse 8. I am not yet, go, yet going to this feast, because for me the right time has not yet come. Jesus completely does everything in God's timing so completely in God's timing we see it over and over and over and over again um, uh, verse 30 and another 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 one that will make you chuckle so the seven verse 30 at this at this so Jesus continues to speak to them at this they try to seize him but no one laid a hand on him so they, they go with their shackles and everything they're ready to seize him their swords and whatever and Jesus goes like nope not the right time yet sorry guys okay. And, I, and, go back. and it happens, I cannot tell you. Once you know this, it's really, really funny. Because you, you see it again and again and again. Okay, so um, just look at how Jesus constantly trying to say this needs to happen from the inside out. Let me take you to verse 38 of chapter 7. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, streams of living water will what? Will flow from within him. And this means the spirit, right? So you need to be changed from the inside. And God remains in you and you remain in Him and His Spirit changes you and works in you from the inside out. Okay? So um, there's, there's another funny one. We're not done yet. In the same chapter, 7 verse 44. Some wanted to seize Him. 
Okay, so let's take our shields, let's take our swords, let's take you know, our shackles, but no one laid a hand on him. So it's so powerful, 744. So, uh, 43, sorry. Uh, 44. Yeah, sorry, 44. Um, these letters are so small. Um, 744. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the lady that gets caught into um, in adultery and everybody wants to, you know, the law says this. Jesus, what do you say? And Jesus says in chapter 8, verse 6, uh, we read that um, he bends down, he writes on the ground um, with his finger. We, we have no idea what he wrote there. One, one cool possibility is that he wrote their sin there, you know, like drunkenness, you know, slander, um, whatever, you know, wrote their sin there. And, um, and they saw that. And they realized that. We, we don't know what he wrote there. He, he might have read a, wrote a passage from one of the prophets there. We don't know what he wrote. We, we can only guess because the text just doesn't tell us. And, and, and they kept questioning him. And then Jesus says, the one who's without sin, let him throw a first stone. Um, and then he starts writing again, verse 8, verse 9. They go, uh, they, they, they go away one at a time. The older ones first. Um, so, who are the older ones in the ancient world? The most important people. So, the most important people that you would think would stay the longest, they actually go first. Okay, so the most important people go first, and then Jesus, and then she says, um, he, uh, Jesus asks her, Is anyone condemning you? And she says in verse 11, No one, sir, and that sir is a horrible translation, and the Greek is actually kirihe. No one kirihe, which is the Greek translation for the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is Lord. So, um, so it's a Greek word for Lord. You will remember that you find this later again, John 20, 28, I believe, when Thomas is not there, when Jesus appears, right? And then John, Thomas puts his hand in the holes. And what does Thomas exclaim? John 20, 28. O kirihe o tehu. My Lord and my God. So she says, no one, Kyrie. Thomas cries out the shortest possible way in which a Christian could confess his faith. My Lord of the Old Testament is also now my God. Or Kyrie of the who? My Lord and also my God. And she says, no one my lord she gets it and then jesus says so i condemn you not because you can come man thank god for the adulterer adulterer adulterous woman in the bible thank god for the adulterous kings in the bible king david right mm -hmm. who committed on top of her murder thank god for peter who betrays jesus right um, uh, you know, well, ach, not betray, what do you say? Deny. Um, you know, so thank God for these things. Uh, because in your brokenness, no matter what it is, you come to God. You acknowledge Him as my God. You are my God. You are my Kyrie. And what comes immediately? No condemnation. No condemnation. With the idea of what? With the idea that you eat that, drink that, make that really part of you, and that it changes you then from the inside out, so that you do not do what now? Go and live your life of sin. Mm -hmm. You know, let that change you. <clears throat> Don't go and do that same thing again. And that can only happen if you are being changed from the inside out. Remember I told you that you will see very clearly um, that Jesus says, I'm from the above, you're from the below, this dualism. I told you it's not my words, it's John's words. So he says in verse 12, I'm the light of the world. He starts to play with this idea of light now, because what do you think of the next miracle coming? The man born blind. blind. You think that's a coincidence? That right before that, Jesus introduces the next I am saying, I am the, I am. I am the light. In other words, you are with me, then you should be able to do what? To, to see, 
right? So I am the light of the world being introduced right before the man being born blind is healed. I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, and then he says, um, oh, yeah, well, time to chuckle again. End of verse 20. Um, you know, he spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near, near a place uh, where the offerings were put. Yet no one sees them because what? The time has not yet come. And then he continues in verse 23. In verse 23 of chapter 8, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. So what does it mean? Verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins. So if you're in this world, you are on a trajectory where you can never get rid of your sin. You need to understand that. So whether you understand about Jesus, know about Jesus, talk about Jesus, um, worship Jesus, sing songs to him and whatever I mean, if he doesn't come from your heart, there's nothing in this world, you cannot do anything good enough to free you of your sin. You have to go into his world. You have to go into the above. And there is a door into the above. Okay? And um, in chapter 10, we are now in chapter I mean, 9 or 8. So in chapter 10, what's coming in chapter 10? He's the gate. He's the gate. So the connection between this world, this below, and the above. His world. There's a gate. You miss the gate? You're stuck in this world. You're stuck in this world? You're stuck in your sin. You're stuck in your sin? Eternal death is your destiny. You understand? So there's nothing in this world, no matter how good you're trying to do it, that can help you out. You have to get into His world. You have to get into the above. This traje trajectory and that one doesn't meet. It's like two train tracks. There's only one connection between these two train tracks. Only one. Only one. And that's Jesus. He's the gate. There's nothing else that can get you off this tra trajectory. Man, that's a difficult word. <laughs> I need to find another word. Um, into this. You understand you that, right? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so um, Jesus said um, in verse 28, When you have lifted the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be. And I do nothing on my own but speak just to what the Father has taught me. More and more now, you will start to see how my time has not yet come. How where you see the clearest that Jesus is God happens at the crucifixion and the resurrection. More and more this will be introduced now. You will get what I'm saying if you stay close to me and see me being crucified and raised from the dead. And then you will see what you need to see. Okay? And so, chapter 9, what happens there? The next miracle. A guy that's blind of being healed. Has he been blind for like two days or three days? No. He's been blind since what? Since birth. This is incredibly important because, um, verse 32, nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. Somebody might have been able to help somebody to come to see or pray for a miracle for somebody to see. But such a miracle has never happened with a man born blind. So the man is being born blind for a specific reason. Okay? Again, it's not just about the miracle. It's about what is it pointing to. And the rabbis are using this as an opportunity to, well, who sinned? Was it this guy? Because he was born blind, right? Did he do something wrong? No, it must be his parents, right? His parents sin, and therefore a punishment of their sin is his being born blind. And so Jesus says this to them, nope, it's not about sinning here, verse 3 of chapter 9. This happens so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. He says it's, it happens so that you can see now what you need to see. And he says you need to see it soon. You don't have forever to see it. Because listen carefully, he constantly plays with light and darkness now, right? Because that's the world, right? You're blind, you're in darkness. Usually the light you can see or you're supposed to see. He says, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. 
Is he just talking about the night and day? No, he's not, right? He's saying, as long as you have me, as long as you have the opportunity, you have the opportunity to come to faith in me, to eat me, to drink me. But you must be careful because this day, this possibility, this time that you have is running out. And when it's run out, the night will come and it's over. Right? I preached a sermon one time that said you don't have forever to get into forever. You don't have forever to get into forever. You only have as long as God chooses for the day to last to get into forever. And then it's over. And so he says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So as long as I'm here, you can see and, 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 and you can get it. And so Jesus heals him. And then people are wondering, who is this? And how is this happening? And then this man comes to faith, right? Just like, just like this um, um, adulterous woman in chapter 8. So this man also comes to faith in, in uh, verse 38. The man said, Lord, right? There it is again, Kyrios. I believe. And he worshipped him, right? He internalized it. He took it, he ate it. And he says, I believe. And Jesus says, for judgment I have come into the world so that the blind will see and those who will see will become blind. Mm -hmm. Is he talking about physical blindness anymore? No, he's not. He's saying, I have come so that those who have not seen, you know, who've been spiritually lost can now see. And those who only want to see this world, they'll become blind. Those who see me and still choose to see only the world, what will happen to them? They, yeah, they will perish. They will become blind. They will be in darkness now and continue to, to stay in darkness forever, right? And so um, the Pharisees were with him and they say, what? Are we blind too? Are you trying to say we are blind? You know, of course we can see and we see everything clearly. We see the prophets. We see what we are supposed to see. We know everything. Who are you? You, you know, you're just the son um, of uh, Joseph here from Galilee. And Jesus says, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. Mm -hmm. If you were actually blind, you would not be able to see me and realize I'm actually the Messiah. And therefore you would not be sinning. But now... You claim to see. So what happens? Your guilt remains. Your guilt remains. It's terrible, right? Um, I, I um, listened to someone speak um, at a Perspectives event on Monday evening. And the speaker, who's also a South African, we realized that when we both started to, to greet each other and we realized we both sound the same. And uh, so Suri and I are actually going in, in May to have uh, a meal with him by just here in Columbus. And he was speaking and he said, you know what, he worked under the um, Uzbekistan people, I believe. Um, and, um, you know, and, and they, uh, so they Muslims. And so they came to, to him and said, um, this book, you say it is better than our book? He said, yes, of course. He said, you say this book, as for light, this book is telling everything that you've been telling us that is so wonderful to hear. He says, yes, this book is telling that. He says, so they say to him, so why do you only bring this book to us now? He say, we don't have this book in our own language. We need to listen to you. But you say this book holds this light. Why did you wait so long to come to us? What about my grandparents? It's already dead. What about my friends and family already died? Why did you wait so long? How many of these are there? He says, there's a whole lot. He says, in fact, in my language, he's an English South African. He says, in my language, there are 64 versions, 64 different English ways. King James, English Revised Version, New International Version, Good News, Message, and, 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 64 different ways of this book. And so this woman says to him, so... 
why only now? And he said to her, please forgive us. That's all I can say. Is please forgive us. Lord, um, we need to do our work while it is still day. And I must confess tonight, I struggle to think what excuse we would be able to come up with if we don't get it. After we have had access to 64 versions of this truth in our own language, what excuse will we be able to come up with? So I pray that after we heard again tonight, saw again tonight, spiritually, that we will fall to our knees and eat you and drink you and say, Lord Jesus, remain in me so that I can remain in you. Lord Jesus, let your spirit come into me and let it unleash a fountain so that the living water can flow out. Not only to my community, but also to the people of Uzbekistan mm -hmm. and the people of Papua, Indonesia, where there are 200 tribes on one island that still do not have a Bible in their own language. On one island. Forgive us. Oh, we have the best news ever. And we still sometimes struggle to get it. And when we get it, we struggle to understand. We need to share it. So, Father, may your children be encouraged by knowing you have touched the whole of them. The whole of them. And changed everything about them. Because you remain in them. And therefore they can have the power and the strength. And the spiritual perspective. Like none other. Mm -hmm. To do incredible things. While it is still day. In Jesus name. Thank you, dear friends. God bless you. Enjoy your weekend. And thank you for coming.